Well, good evening. How is everybody? Unable to see the board lead. Put on your glasses, Matthew. All right. Due to confusion, communication failures, lack of effort on some people's parts, and that's not meaning y'all, by the way, it means whoever destroyed the VMs as far as the ability to get online has ruined y'all's chances to really do the project the way I intended it. So, with that said, I'm going to change that scope of those projects a little bit more. Hang on, Ryan. The way I'm going to change the scope is I'm not going to expect you to implement anything. I'm going to put on a SCAP tool on each one on your Apache machine and on your Microsoft machine. And over the next two weeks, you're going to, after I lecture you for what we have to lecture to get the information across that's part of the curriculum for this class, you're going to get a few minutes with your group and you're going to get to run these SCAP tools just to kind of see what kind of information, basically what it's an automated version of what you were doing, okay, of going and looking at the sticks. It will give you a printout summary report. What I may do is just put it on there and run them and show you a report. So to speed it up so y'all don't have to worry about it. Would that be easier for y'all? Basically kind of j just show you how it runs, go through the process, make that part of a lecture. I want you to be able to see the scope of it, and then we can say, oh, here's an unsecured system. Here's what it's going to look like. All right, I have a SCAP report for a system on a building that I ran on. I can bring that up, and we can discuss that, and I can show you what this SCAP report would look like. Okay? What this, this project is for you to have seen how to secure your website by getting these vulnerabilities, fixing these vulnerabilities, then implementing two different types of a website, a secured website and an unsecured website, and being able to see the traffic interchange by this website. Basically, you're going to build an e-commerce website with shopping carts, and you're going to transmit traffic to the other machine. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to be able to see by running Wireshark when you submit the traffic, is it sent in clear text or is it sent in SSL? When, well, when it's sent in SSL versus when it's sent unsecurely. See the difference and see, oh, all my traffic when I'm running credit card on just a regular HTTP site, people can see it. It's pretty scary, isn't it? So that's why you always look for the, the green key and the, and the gold block, right, on your browsers when, when you're trying to do anything online. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk today a little bit about secure e-commerce. I want to give you some fundamental background about secure e-commerce, where it came from, what we're talking about. We're going to talk a little... I'm going to skip through quite a bit on the second slideshow of it, where we're talking about uh, network topology. How many of y'all have had introduction to networking or wireless networking? So y'all know what network topologies are, right? I'm not going to go too far in depth on it, because you'll understand it. When did electronic uh, commerce come into history, or the history? Well, it came in about the mid-90s to 2000s when we had the dot-com boom. Y'all remember that, right? Or most of you, anyway? Basically, everyone's like, oh, yeah, everyone's going to be able to start buying online. It's going to speed things up. Well, now we can do it on our smartphones, right? Square, we can slide things. It's actually pretty cool that I uh, can't really tell. Is that a... Six seven eight two zero one zero. That's probably not a, a legit card, but anyway, electronic commerce. We can use shopping cards. We can do ba business trading practices. Remember, we can do it from business to business, business to consumer, consumer to consumer. 
there's a variety of ways that you can do it. You can do it over the web, you can do it in person, we can do over phones, over cellular networks, right? But what is the basis for security commerce? What about the security? What about the trust? If we don't have it, do you want to spend your money there? So if let's define a few terms. When you see B2C for the rest of the semester, it's going to be business to consumer. That's that's 95% of your you're shopping online. Okay, they provide a service to you and you buy it. Business to business, that's e-procurement. That's Walmart buying it from ABC Auto Parts, getting the, those supplies in, or buying them from Fram Auto Parts, getting those Fram oil filters in the in the uh, Tire Lube and Express, right? That's e-procurement. Business processes. We can also do customer to customer, which is C2C, or business to government. How many of y'all have ever seen business to government? Guess what? Raise your hand. What about C2G? Consumer to government. Everybody raise your hand. You are one. Because this building, this school, is a government agency. You are a consumer. Okay. What are the elements of an e-commerce? Well, the business-to-business -business sector is going to be a lot bigger than a business-to-consumer. Why is that? Businesses have a heck of a lot more money, right? And businesses are going to purchase a lot more than a consumer will. Where we may buy one uh, in quantities of one, Walmart buys in quantities of millions. So let's define a couple other terms. Activity. What is an activity? Well, it's a task performed by a worker in the course of doing their job. Day-to-day -day operation, that's an activity. Transaction is the exchange of value, the purchase, the sale, conversion of raw materials. So if I have a transaction, that's what is happening at the cash registers, right? That's why they call it transaction receipt. Business process is that activity and transaction in every part of the business put together. The whole scope of the business. Well, the idea of Secure e-commerce came in the idea or was developed to say, how is the web going to help us enhance our business? Well, how many of you telecommute? How many of you telecommute? Anyone? One? Okay. As you can see, it helps Adam a little bit. Doesn't really help much of it. the rest of us, does it? Well, what about <clears throat> consumer to consumer? What about eBay? Is that not consumer to consumer? Craigslist? It's probably a C to B to C, right? Because you got to go through Craigslist to get back to the other individual. Business to government, paying taxes. Oh, IRS. Yeah. The development of secure e-commerce came by people in, engaging in commerce. The more that people started spending money, the more ways it became enveloped in the pro business processes. The faster the internet, the more reliable, uh, reliable computers, the uh, more that people relied on the internet and computers, the bigger the e-commerce arena became. All right. How many of you are familiar with EFTs? If you have a job, you probably have an EFT of some kind, right? Where your money is deposited into your account. An ACH transaction. Wire transfers. That has become the new thing, right? Instead of giving you that printing out that paycheck and you having to take it to the bank and then it, it's not deposited. You deposit it on a Friday and you might not have the money until Monday. Those days are gone. You get the you get the paycheck on Friday. Your money is in there on Friday. Isn't that nice? You can actually go out on a date on that Friday night. We have what's called the electronic data interchange. Now, this is a big part that you really need to understand. This is where business to business transactions occur. All it does is it's where 
Walmart, when I was using the frame oil filter, that's where when Walmart's inventory gets to a certain level, it automatically transpires to Fran and says, Fran, I need X amount of oil filters. And Fran can send it. They trust each other in a SOA environment, service-oriented architecture, so that this traffic can be changed. Those are the, what we call trading partners, right? Walmart buys them from them, and I'm sure they get some stuff from Walmart, too. But the pioneers were GE, Sears, and Walmart. Those were the big three, all right? All it did was just to help that supplier and retailer relationship. Well, as if with anything, the, the, at first, you're going to have a high-end cost, right? And the more and more you do it, the less and less cost it becomes because you, you find ways to better and, and you get more value out of it, right? So that's what Secure Commerce has done. EDI has allowed independent firms now to access this supplier network and be able to get information. Part of this EDI now is how your tra uh, credit cards are transpired or uh, sent from the merchant to your bank. Okay. In 1997, there were only 12,000 internet related businesses at $100 billion. Three years later, it was $200 billion. What do you think it is now? I think it's a lot more than that. Yeah, try about nine point five trillion. And that's business to business. Three hundred and sixty. Remember the Industrial Revolution? Yeah, No, you don't. I was there. No, you weren't. We had two waves, really. The first wave, it started in the United States. Then it spread globally, right? Pretty much? Yeah. Well, startup capital. It says it's easy to obtain. I laughed at that. How hard is it to get capital? That's right. The second wave is when the companies start using their own funds to fund things, okay? Internet technologies are slow and inexpensive. And then the second wave was broadband. As you can see, we are con continue to progress, okay? Internet technology integration, they started out with barcodes and scanners. Now we're get, doing smart cards, RFIDs, right? Email, it was unstructured all text-based. Now it's an integ integral part of communicating inside your workplace. The revenue source used to be online advertising. It failed. Now internet advertising is they market you specifically. Right? So how do we build e-commerce into a business model? Anyone have an idea? Streamline. Sounds very familiar. What about Facebook and Google? They streamlined. When they did that, it went great. Instead of copying business models, they created their own by streamlining the resources, using internet and networks to enhance their model. Remember, companies think in terms of businesses processes rather than, you know, more of the business type stuff. Cost of goods sold, revenue, raw resources, uh, labor, power, water, utilities, that, that kind of stuff. Well, what does e-commerce do for them? That's just one piece of their puzzle. If you use internet technologies, how much do you think it's going to benefit your company? Could it? Absolutely. 
If you don't use it today, are you behind the power curve? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ex exactly. Think about merchandising. Salespeople. How many times do you have a salesperson come to your door now that doesn't have some sort of smartphone or tablet or something with them? Let me show you how it does it here. And he's flipping across his iPad. Right? Because being able to see it in multitudes instead of having people draw it out like they used to speeds up the thought process. I can get to more people quicker and have a higher rate of return on my investment. So let's talk a little bit about product sustainability. Let's talk about commodities. Commodities. What what is a commodity? It's a certain type of item. Yeah. Okay. What commodity item is well suited for the internet? Do what? Downloads. Downloads. Very quickly. Think about Amazon, Netflix, right? Or, uh, Hulu Plus, you know, what are some of the other ones? You know, what about ship, shipping profiles? How quick is it going to be um, that a package can get to you because of your zip code? See, yes? Coming back to, not the last one, but the previous, you brought up about... Um, this one? I believe so. Yeah, what, um, what I was, I, was, I had something I was going to say about those retails that do both online sales and store. Mm -hmm. Their stores suffer because people don't want to pay the tax when they can go online. Yep. And how many of you really want to stand in a Black Friday line when you can do it by just hitting enter key? I mean, seriously, I can sit at home eating some popcorn and purchase it quicker than someone running into the store getting stabbed. But of course, so at the same time that we have 43 million other pe pe people clicking enter at the same time as you are, who's to say you're going to get it? Like, prime example of Black Friday or Friday, they ran that 42 inch TV on sale for like 200 bucks. They were out within 17 se 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 seconds of it going up. It was gone. I mean, were you quick enough to press it that fast? Were you quick enough to ramp through all the people and elbow them in the face? Oh, you're full. We got a full contact person up here. We're not going to mess with the lease. You know, there are easier sell products, your electronics like Kodak and things like that. Then you're going to have your traditional stuff that you, your high-priced Armani suits. You think you're going to sell them online? No. no. You're going to have to go to this high-end dress shop to get that. Combination of electronic and traditional commerce. Okay, E-commerce increases sales, right? It's another avenue to push out sales. E-commerce buyer opportunities. Why? Because the store's open 24-7. Right? You don't have to pay for the person to be there while someone's clicking. Other than the day when you have that IT person that's sitting there twiddling their thumbs because everything works perfectly, right? We're all IT people. We know that. No laughs. Uh, I was going to say those are the best days. Yeah, when you sit there and you're just like, I'm going to play solitaire today. Everything's working. Web 2.0 is the second generation of the World Wide Web. That's where you're going to have, you went from the transition of static web pages to more of the dynamic sites where everything is, instantaneous. Now, today, why did Ken throw this slide in there? Okay. I forgot to bring my phone with me when I went <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, y'all got the hint, right? It's all about our lives are now so tied to electronics that we can't get away. What are the benefits of general society welfare? What are the benefits of security commerce? Can you imagine not having to go print all those tags and have someone have to pay someone to go put them up on everything when you can just do it on a website like this? Do control H, replace everything twelve ninety nine down to five ninety nine, hit enter. After the sale, control H, five ninety nine, thirty five ninety nine. Isn't that how they do it? You don't have to pay commissions for sales. Yep. Less overhead. Less overhead. Yep. Poor choices for e commerce. Perishable foods. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't Amazon now deliver food though? Yeah. It's an Amazon yeah. Yeah, so. you know, they're supposed to have like that little robot or something that delivers it to little, you. Little drones. Yeah. Well, no, no, drones. They're, I mean, they're trying it out in larger mar markets, but you're able to order food and they'll bring you a week's worth of food and just put it off at your doorstep. Yeah. They're saying that this is going to happen. Uh, less and less frequently as e-commerce becomes bigger and bigger. But really, th think of Don Mano's pizza tracker. You can see exactly where every step of your pizza is. Isn't that, it's almost kind of scary. John, put your pizza in the oven. You know, Do I care that John put my pizza in the oven? I just care when it gets to my house that it's hot and fresh and I'm ready to eat it. I just care that they washed his hands before he went to the bathroom. That's what I care about. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't tell you on there. Yeah. Total cost to the buyer and seller, you know, what is the cost of the buyer? They put it on, uh, we, we end up taking that cost, right, for going to e-commerce. It may be minuscule, but it's still there. Delivery fees. Don't you love those delivery fees? They say that they don't go to the drivers. $3 now to deliver a pizza? Better be ordering a couple hundred dollars worth of pizza to get it just to pay, make that well worth it. E-commerce, what really is it? You thrive in it, right? Anytime you swipe your card, anytime you use a computer, you're in that market. Well, it's neither really a market nor a hierarchy. It's just partnerships. I'm not going to go through this part of it because they don't exist anymore. Network organizations are going to be there for people to use. Like, knitters organize into networks of smaller organizations. Right? Get a bunch of old ladies knitting together. They specialize in a specific style or design. Well, e commerce can be the exact same way. The smaller the network, the easier to maintain. And they're going to be more and more prominent in the future. Um, it's basically rehashing the same thing over and over. If you're going to use secure e-commerce and or if you're going to use e-commerce in your business, you need to focus on what specific business task are you trying to do? Are you trying to sell something? Are you trying to create revenue? Like how many of you all go to sites and say donate here? You know, you're not really trying to sell anything, are you? You're just trying to get funds, raise capital. What what is the the activity that you're trying to do? Do what? Like you, go, go to Wikipedia. They have their yeah, they're all like that. Yep. All they're trying to sell is continuity of operation. Yep. You you can get Google Wallet and download uh, donate here's PayPal donate here's. Um, all it does is just sends you three bucks if someone clicks donate and 
It's three money, free money to you. Of course, I'm sure there's a purpose that you're trying to do that and not trying to defraud them. The value chain, again, what, what are we trying to purchase? What are we trying to go for? SWOT analysis. What are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in a business that we have to think about when we're doing a, going to build a secure e-commerce or an e-commerce site? What's our strengths? What's our weaknesses? Remember, strengths and weaknesses, what are they? They're internal to your company. Opportunities and threats, those are external to your company. How many of y'all knew that? None of you? Hmm. Strengths and weaknesses are internal to your company. Opportunities and threats are external. So strengths and opportunities are on the same, they're positives. Weaknesses and threats are negatives, right? You have your internals and your externals. It's really the same thing. And here's just examples of them. Internet basically uh, connects all the computers. It's, it's a trust network, right? We all connect in the same <clears throat> megaplex of mass binary digits. Well, they're based off of trust in a global environment. But you have to keep that trust to keep web commerce alive, right? Because as soon as someone is not trusted, they're dropped off, right? I don't trust you, Kelly. I'm going to drop you off my network now, right? Probably not. But maybe so. We'll just have to see. On the internet, no one knows that you're a dog. Pretty good illustration about child predators, right? You never know exactly what you're going to get. Businesses must adapt to local cultures. Why? Because if I don't, then am I going to get any sales? If I put an English-only website out there in China, how many sales am I going to get? I need to have it translated into Mandarin, right? Even some images could be offensive. Exactly. By 2015, 70% of all e-commerce transactions will involve at least one party outside of the United States. That's scary. Well, then again, when you think of China and, and India being involved in that, well, that kind of explains it. That's two-thirds of the population. Large site translation may be prohibitive. In other words, do you want to have a megaplex of one site, one shop stop? One stop shop. I can't talk. No, not really. That's why you have an eBay. That's why you have an Amazon. They're going to end up killing themselves because they're going to get too big for their own good. Just think about this. In South, South African languages in 2001, how many languages are up there? There are 13 different languages in South Africa. Could you imagine how many different coding languages you'd have to have for that? So, one, when you're talking about doing e-commerce in different countries, it's just like as a business. Are you going to go out to a country not knowing their culture, not knowing what may or may not be offensive to them, what their customs and courtesies are, how to dress, how to talk, are you going to not know that when you go over there for a business transaction with the company? And same thing with e-commerce. You don't want to do that. Even if you're still stateside, you want to make sure that you give that same presence out there to the country in which you're trying to target. Because it could be... Um, like, for example, baby, baby food in jars in Africa... They may be thinking you're selling babies in jars. Would 
wouldn't that come across wrong? Okay. The hand signal. This is actually obscene in Brazil. So just don't go to Brazil and do this. Huh. I wonder how they died. <laughs> you know, just, just kind of pay... Uh, You want to make sure that you do, um, <clears throat> I don't want to say be politically correct, but you want to put your best foot forward in everything you do, right? Same way in security commerce or in e-commerce. You want to put your best foot forward. You want to have online discussions with in, uh, discussion inhospitable to cultural environments. You, like we've just been talking about, you want to make sure that you get your point across the correct way to the country in which you're doing. Because some countries won't let you. And I was just talking to Armand this morning about FTP. Do you know you cannot FTP from Iran into the United States? You can go external, but you cannot come internal to request an IP address. It is prohibitive. You can visit a website, but you cannot FTP. Internet censorship. How many people think that happens? How would that work? Do you have to have like an AC, like a, how would you do that? It's some, just some sort of ACL list. But Why don't you ask the National Security Agency? I don't even know if you actually knew. Right? Yes, I know it happens. Okay. They are the ones that control the external ports on both sides. Oh, okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. They block the traffic coming in and out of the United States, just like China does at China. Okay. Google had to redesign their search engine just so they could go into China based mm -hmm. on China's laws. Yep. And it's not just China, there's several others. Remember, like for example, y'all remember seeing the Google car going around, right, taking the street view? You know it's illegal in the European countries to do that, and they did it anyway. Now they're in all sorts of arms about it, or they've been for several years now. Well, Google didn't check with the customs and courtesies of the country when they did it. Now they're having to deal with all that. So Google is taking down the majority of the street views. Now they've left the open highways on, but they've been working with the countries on what can and can't be. Business face challenges posed by variations and inadequacies of the infrastructure supporting the Internet through the world. In other words, you've got countries, like third world countries, that may be lucky if they have a 56K dial-up. Are we thinking about that? Are we thinking about putting flash that requires you to have a 100 megabit Internet connection to view? You know, are we still thinking about those 503 type activities for the ADA compliance. Are y'all thinking about these kind of things? Bonded warehouse. In other words, do you have a warehouse for all these shipments of cargo? This is more of the business type stuff that I'm going to be kind of skipping. But for an international transaction, these are just some of the parts that you'd have to deal with. Crazy, isn't it? Now, we're going to talk a little bit about credit. <clears throat> what is credit? Well, Kelly owes me money. It's a credit, right? I said she's worth $500. Adam's worth a million. You like that credit line, don't you? Okay. Well, back in the early 1900s, the United States really started to, to develop the credit card industry, as we now know it. You had diners' cards, you had, uh, 
which was called the Diurners Club, and it's still been around. But uh, it was initially given to 200 people and accepted in 27 restaurants in New York. You were charged a monthly fee and had a 7% surcharge on all transactions. Wouldn't that stink? The company got their money, didn't they? Now... <laughs> now we literally have thousands of different types of cards. American Express, Diner Club are, st are still done by the same institution. MasterCard and Visa are really their own companies, but they charge memberships to organizations like your, your debit cards. Your banks pay that membership fee to them. And then they brand their cards with their Visa or MasterCard logo. As of a couple of years ago, there was an average of five cards for every man, woman, and child in the United States. Five cards. I, I still like this one. If we only had a mailing address, we could get a pre-approved credit card application. Most internet purchases are credit card transactions. Used to, people would not be able to do uh, credit card transactions because they took forever. Now they, you can get your results in five seconds or less. A single transaction goes up to five different places. Consumer, merchant, consumer's bank, merchant's bank, and interbank network. So what's going to happen is the consumer goes up to the register and says, here's what I want to buy. They ring it up. Merchant charges it. Goes to the acquiring bank who then sends it over to the consumer's bank that sends back the author, authentic the authorization code back to the acquiring bank who then sends it back to the merchant saying, yes, you're good. They give the goods to the consumer. At the end of the day, that merchant then sends to the acquiring bank, I want my money. The, the uh, acquiring bank then sends it back to the consumer bank. The consumer bank sends the money over to the acquiring bank. Acquiring bank then puts it in the merchant's account. It's funny, you don't even hear about CODs anymore. Nope, they want their money now. Now here's what we're going to have a little fun with. Y'all ready for some math? Mm. Yay! You want to know how to know if your credit card's valid? If you ever want to steal a credit card, you want to know how to know it's valid, or if you want to make a false one. I'm going to teach you the algorithm for the check digit. What you do, if you have a credit card, if the first digit on your card is an even number. Or, I mean, you have the 16 digits, right? Even number of digits. You'll start with a 2. Your next number will be 1, 2, 1, 2, so forth. Okay, this is your multiplier. If, after you multiply the digit right above it, and I'll show you on the next slide how it works, if the weight is greater than 9, you'll subtract 9 from it to get, the, to get a number less than 9. Okay, so in other words, if it's 10, you take 9 away, you have 1. You with me? Then you're going to add up all the digits together the, after the multiplier. You're going to mod it by 10, which means you're dividing it by 10 and finding out what the remainder is. If the remainder is a zero, the credit card's a valid card. I'm not telling you to pull out your wallets to do it, but here we go. If the card was 3356-1131472991389138, since there are 16 digits, we start with a 2. So we have a 2, 1, 2, 1. Those are my multipliers. So 3 times 2 is 6. 3 times 1 is 3, so <coughs> forth and so on, right? Go with me? Okay. Except we have 5 times 2 is 10, right? But then we have to take our 9 away. That's what gives us a 1. You do that for the same columns over here. Then I say, okay, now I've got to add all these up. So I've got 16 here, I have 10 here, I've got 28 here, and I've got 24 here, which means these two right here are 52, these two right here are 26, which gives me a 78. If I mod it by 10, I have an invalid card. So that's why on whatever cards there will be those extra numbers on the back. Otherwise, you just no. throw out the number? No. These are your 16 digits on the front of your card. Yes. So if I give that information to a 
website. The CVV is a security code. It just means that you have, it can prove that you have it physically in your hand. Yeah, that's what I mean, because otherwise uh, that's, you could calculate all possible credit card numbers and just buy things. Yes, Armand, I know you want to do this. How does PIN number, like, in my bank, they say that if you lost your PIN number, you have to get a new credit card, because your PIN is the same thing as your number, makes up your number. I don't know why they'd tell you that, because they can reset your PIN. They just don't want to, because it would be a, a vulnerability, because anyone could walk in and claim them to be you. Normal credit cards, you can charge anywhere from 1% to 7% paid by the merchant per swipe. Now, it's usually, you can either have a, a typical one that I've got right now is a two, uh, 1.74 and plus, or is it, yeah, 1.74. And if I have to key it in, it's a 2.74. Um, and then some will actually say, you get the 1.74 plus 25% per swipe. Um, there's no no more cash. This restaurant decided we're only going to take credit cards. Stupid DC. Okay, credit cards tr uh, transactions. Remember, it's a two-way street. They can issue you refunds, but you can also charge the information back to them. You can do a chargeback on the card. You can say, they gave me something wrong or they overcharged me. The bank say, no, I don't like this. They can charge it back. Like tonight, I got double billed for my, my dinner. I've already called the bank. They have done a chargeback on it. So my account shows that I still have that $15.08 charge available for me. Now that company has to deal with it. So that, that's how it works. Debit cards, like we said, they're Visa or MasterCard that are branded just like the normal card. The big difference, it's immediately deducted from your bank account instead of it being a credit line. Y'all all know that, right? But be sure you read your liability carefully because the difference between a credit card and a debit card, debit card, you have no fraud liability. In other words, if I steal your debit card, I can go for a joyride and take everything out of your bank account and you're still liable for it. Wait. If it's a credit card, I only got you for $50. You're only responsible for 50 If you make a transaction and you choose debit and mm -hmm. there's fraud on that transaction, you're stuck with the bank. Yep. And then, but if you did it under credit, then you're protected by a visa. Mm -hmm. So that's a hint. If you steal anyone's credit card, do it as a debit. But you have to know their pin in order to do that. All right, I'm going to skip virtual pin and eCash because neither one of those are actually in function anymore. Um, when credit cards, they have three different types of privacy modes. You have anonymous, private, and identifying. Anonymous, basically, you're theoretically anonymous. I can still find you. Private means the payment center may tell the merchant who you are, and then identifying will tell who you are. Okay? Virtual PIN, all it does, it was a company that would uh, take a, you would call them up, create a PIN for all your credit cards, and then you could just go to a merchant, give them a PIN, along with when you swipe the card, it asks for a PIN, you put in your PIN, then it would, uh, send you an email you would have to say yes no or yes i did it no i didn't or it's fraud if you said yes then the transaction would go through if you said no or fraud it would kick it back that it was fraud and the transaction would be declined and then the store would take over from whatever it needed to do some stores will actually give them back yeah, nowadays they make you swipe your own, so they never really hold it in possession. Yeah. So they like free them up, like for liability purposes, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Okay. I don't. I don't like anyone holding my cards anyway. So, but I also one thing I always put on the back of mine is say CID, and they're actually required to look at your signature anyway. No one ever does it, but when they do, they say CID. 
they look at your ID and it validates that you're there. Which is fun when I go, what the heck does Sid mean? Oh, thanks, first time I saw that ever. But of course, unlike, unlike where I work, I was told that I'm not allowed to check IDs. You're um, required by law to. Yeah, my, my store doesn't care. I Because we would have people come in and buy a thousand dollars worth of stuff, and like, can I see your card and ID? They didn't have their ID, and I'm like, sorry, I can't do that. My DM was like, you don't have to check their, their, their you, ID. You know, why the, you know why the DM doesn't want you to do it? Well, yeah, because the DM loses money. Yeah. But I mean, uh, um, he cares about the bottom line. He doesn't care about, uh, and he doesn't want to piss off a customer. That, that's really all it amounts to. Well, I mean, he told us to call this number that we get authorization through. We called it, it double charged their card. <laughs> it, put, it puts a hold on their card and then, and then charges them. Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. it's stupid. So, yeah. Digicash basically is the same thing, except it was using digital coins. How many of y'all know Bitcoins? Oh, Digicoins was its predecessor. Okay, and then there was Digica or CyberCash, similar to CyberCoin, what it did um, before VeriSign bought it out. What it'd do is you could go to a bank, deposit money, get it out as this, send it to the U.S. Mint, they would validate it, and send it back. You'd do it double-blinded so they couldn't find out who you were. So basically you could launder money through the U.S. Mint. That's why they ended up being bankrupt. <laughs> um, I'm surprised that it took them that long to figure it out. But anyway. <laughs> and that's what, what CyberCash was about. Y'all know about PayPal, right? Oh, yeah. What's this thing? Best friend. It's a service, a payment service that was owned by eBay, or still owned by eBay. It allows you to pay online with a credit card, bank account, PayPal. Uh, it's just a processor for bank account information. Uh, does bookkeeping rec uh, record systems for uh, eBay, and you can also use it for multiple other services now. You actually gain interest by keeping money. Mm hmm. Basically, all it is is a credit card processor. I mean, is that thing called First Bank of Mir Miracles? Go, go back to the slide. It is. Like, it interest. Oh. oh, no, it's sending it to that First Bank of Miracles. I thought it was. I thought you were mispronouncing mercantile. <laughs> PayPal is a booking and rep, uh, recording system, so you can see all the online transactions. This is where IRS can come and get you. It's also a financial hub that can link all your information. The question is, do you want to put all that information out there? Yes. Guess who got hit with Open SSL? So that's what PayPal looks like. Now y'all ready for the network infrastructure slides? I know I've really just bored y'all to death tonight, haven't I? We're going to talk about information systems, the internet, client server, computing, wireless technologies, and the web. We should go through this in a breeze. Information systems, what do they do? They store, process, and transmit and present data for a lot of different things. They can exist at the edge of the information of or, or the edge of a network. They can be in three categories, a desktop, server, or embedded system. Usually if it's on the edge of the network, it's in what A? What is it in? <coughs> What's on the edge of a network? DMZ. DMZ. Desktop computers. Largest market by dollar. Typically priced between a thousand and ten thousand dollars. That is a really old slide. I can get them for a hundred to a thousand dollars now. Of course, the higher end, the more good stuff you got. Demands for uh, servers demand for reliable file and computing services grow. They're more about availability and scalability, right? Embedded systems is a fast-growing segment of the computer market. They give you complexity and performance, and uh, they have problems, they give you a lot of memory, and they also take up a lot of power. Technology trends. This was a long time ago, I'm not even going to worry about it. The internet. The interconnected network of thousands of millions of computers, right? 
World Wide Web is just web pages that consist on those computers. The history of the Internet can be segmented into three phases, the innovation, the institutionalization, and commercialization. The innovation, ARPANET, institutionalization, when it became into the educational arena, right? The Department of Education took it over. Commercialization, when it left the Department of Education and Business started using it. Packet switching, when we started doing uh, internet working between companies, right? We used routers to transmit between different scenarios or different companies, different LANs, different WANs. Here's an example of it. I want to communicate with you. There it is in binary. Actually, it's a lot more than that. Digital, they're broken into the bit, uh, bytes. I don't know why they're saying packets. And then each packet gets a header put on it and sent on. I love it when they don't use the correct information there. Because actually that would convert into hex, which would convert probably all that is I. Protocol. What is a protocol? It's just a set of rules. TCP, it's a protocol. IP is a protocol. TCP IP. What is it? It's just a protocol that routes traffic. Pretty simple. IP address. 32-bit 30, address in a series of four octets, like 201.61, 186, 2.27. And handle up to 4 billion IP addresses. IPv6 is the next one, which we're st starting to go to now. 128 bit address can handle up to 1 quadrillion addresses, which means 1 million addresses per square foot on the face of the planet. A quadrillion, that's like four sets of, that's like 12 zeros, right? Yeah. Like one with 12 zeros. So, something like that. It's still inelegant. It's a million billion. It's inelegant. Okay. Anyway, this is how... IPv6. Here's how TCP IP works. It goes to this router. It can go to here to go down, or it can go to here to go down, figure out which way it wants to go, and just routes traffic. That's what TCP IP packet switching does. Domain, uh, domain addresses, it's just a colloquial name. You can say tobykeith.com. The DNS would take tobykeith.com, translate it into an IP address. That's what DNS does. The Uniform Resource Locator is the address used by the website, which is the domain name. We have what we call the root server, which is your dot. How many of you knew that the dot was the root server? One person? Two? Anyone else? You go into the address bar, you type dot, that's the root server. So if you do dot com, that's the second level servers. So AOL.com is a subset of the second level server. So it's a, really a third level server. You all understand the hierarchy now of the web? No, I'm just saying that is an example. Well, you could put it in there. Google will give you eh, wrong answer. That's what I'm saying, yeah. I'm sure those things are guarded under lock and key just to keep people from being stupid. Probably not. Client-server computing. Basically, you have a client that connects to a server. This environment that you're in is a client-server. You have to log in with the domain credentials to get in. Basically, all the clients out here on the network connect to this to authenticate, to get into the applications or shared resources. It's used quite a bit today. Here's the hourglass model of the internet, layer one. is all your small local lands, the types of topologies. Layer two, that's going to be your transport services What in uh, more protocols, layer three. This is your middleware services. What services are you running? And then layer four is going to be your applications. 
here's an example of what a network infrastructure can look like. You're going to have your local gives up your domain. Your domain goes to your regional host. Regional host goes. Well, this is real strange drawing. And then it hits out to some backbone somewhere. Okay. Your NSPs right here are your network service providers. What is the bandwidth? Well, that's how much flow of traffic you're going to be able to uh, tr transfer over your communications line. You need to be in uh, bits, kilobits, megabits, or gigabits. How many of y'all are in gigabit speed? Hubs are where backbones intersect with the regional and networks. Not to be confused with the networking device called a hub. Um, you're either going to have metropolitan access exchanges or uh, network access points. Either way. You're all familiar with the CAN, right? Campus area network. That's what we have here at Rose State. The last mile of service is what, what the retail provides, like Cox Cable. They're the last mile of service. AOL, MSN, and AT&T Worldwide are major uh, ISPs. Intranets are your local internet, um, local inside your own firewall. Extranet is a internal website that can be seen from outside. Wireless internet access concerned with the last mile. You can get it from your phone, PDA, things of that nature. You need to dial in with uh, VPNs or telephone based. There's some wireless uh, types. 4G is not on here. Y'all remember CDMA? And GSMs and 3Gs and I don't remember 2.5Gs, I remember 2G. Any of y'all remember 2.5G? I think it was a typo. How many of y'all know that Wi-Fi really only goes to about 300 feet? Line of sight. Well, those that are my uh, wireless class, you better have raised your hand. Right, Ashley? Rick? Adam? Otherwise, you're going to fail my final? That's one of your questions? Yeah, how do y'all like this difference right here? Is that really that much of a difference in speed? I don't think so. There's different... Uh, Standards, GSM is used in Europe and CDMA is used here in the U.S. And uh, LTE, basically, y'all know what LTE stands for, long-term evolution? Y'all know why it's faster than 3G? How many of y'all know what LTE really is? Sort of, it's... Okay, let, I'll explain it. Instead of, in 3G, you would get one connection to one tower. That's all you would get. With 4G LTE, you have three triangular triangulation towers that are pointing to you. So you have three antennas connecting to you at one time. So that, you're getting three times the speed coming into your phone. That make more sense? That's why it's faster. They slow it down. But you get three times the speed, so you still get a speed increase. Yeah. LTE network promises high throughput speeds, low latency, data rates of uh, five to twelve megabits download and two to five megabits upload. Ha 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 ha. There's two G and three G images. That's what LTE is supposed to be able to do. I've never known a cash register on a LTE. Just me. What's the differences between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi? Anyone know? Besides my wireless students. Bluetooth is a personal area network. It can only go up to 33 feet. Like Kelly's headset. Wi-Fi can go up to 300 feet. That's really the difference. It's a Wi-Fi that's closer for your personal area network. That's why you have the Bluetooth earphones. The development of the web, um, 
this information is incorrect. It started with ARPANET. But uh, they say it came out at CERN, then uh, NCSA, and then Netscape was the first actual web browser. And that came out with, when they were starting to do GML with the first markup language. And then 95 IE came out. Mm hmm And then um, HTTP was based off of GMLs, Generalized Markup Languages. Then we went to the standard, and then HT, uh, HTML was a GML that was easy to read tags. And then we created XML, which are more what you need to use for specific purposes. And those are different types of those. Web server software, uh, web server software, you can do Apache or IIS. They read a HTML and XML. Leading brands, like I said, are Apache and IIS, not Microsoft. Basic capabilities um, for webs, security services, FTP, search engines, data capturing. You can do uh, mail servers, video servers, database servers, application servers, file servers. There's a lot of things you can do. The internet and the web, y'all are familiar with that, right? Y'all know what you can do on the web. Y'all play around with it all the time. Facebook, LinkedIn, social medias, Twitters, Instagrams. I don't know, what are, what are the rest of them are out there? Snapchat now. Snapchat. It's getting up there. Any questions? Not even going there. All right. So what we're going to do, I'll get to you in just a second now. For your final exam, Elisa's like, please, please, please. What we're going to do for the projects in the final exam, the, the projects, you're still going to work in your groups, but uh, I'm going to go over them with you of what we need to do, all right? Meaning that you're not really going to implement anything as your group. I want you to just discuss it, you know, five, ten minutes every week with your group. Does that make sense of what you learned? For your final exam, I'm going to have you write a couple essays. Well, type them actually. And they're going to be based on the project, and one's going to be based on the lectures. And I may say, give me what you understood about this topic. And then you're going to tell me. All right. Does that make sense? Have I lost anyone on that? Yes, Lance. Um, so the questions for the essay will be what did you learn about or what did I'll, I'll, There'll be specific questions. Okay. But it'll be, your answer will be generic in nature. Like I would say, on 428, we talked about EDI. Why was it important? And then you would just tell me why you thought it was important. Does that make sense? And then I may ask you something specific about the project like, what were the basic steps to install IIS or what were what type of information did you learn from reading the sticks? Does that make sense? It's going to be more of your opinion answers rather than a specific answer. Does that make sense? 
So I don't want to say there's no wrong answer, but if you're way off base, you're not going to get credit. Does that make sense? I'm just making sure everyone's on the same page. You understand what I'm saying. I'd like to see this. Basic understanding. Yes, I'm looking that you learned something. Not that you were so far out here and didn't bother to ask me any questions and, and just ignored it. Because that does you no good. Because if you don't ask me any questions and you don't understand the concepts, whose fault is it? I've given you the material. The emphasis is on you to, to learn it and to ask questions. All right? It'll be easy. Don't worry too much about it. Your final is going to be that Monday, two weeks from tonight. Do what? It'll be in D2L right after I give you a lecture. And that's due on the 12th. Yes. Yes. I hadn't forgotten. Yes. The 10th for. Then that's correct. Whatever it has for the drop boxes, the dates do. I believe that's the Saturday before. Yes. Okay. There was a question on where you need to go for those 10 references, right? On the paper. I'll show y'all because y'all were concerned about, oh, we've got to pay. If you go down to the very bottom of the rose.edu website, the, the bottom bar, you come down here, click on library. You can go here where it says online databases and specialized indexes. You come down to the second section here. Just click on EBSCOhost. And EBSCOhost web. You will search all. Does all those that I was telling you about, like your computing and applied sciences, all those, well, that computing and applied sciences actually has all those journals. Continue. You just type in what, what it is. You're going to want full text and scholarly. You can put in here what publication or what journal you're looking for. I don't really care that you put that in there. Just make sure that it's full text and scholarly. If you do those two things, I'm fine with it, even if it's not on that list. But it must match those two. Does it make sense? So let's do SSL. No, we don't need staff of local call. SSL TLS right here, right? So we can come down here, open this up, and we can read in here. Right here where it says this first paragraph, that is what we call an abstract. You can read this. I don't know if you can really see it very much, but basically it's talking about SSL TLS and it's talking about open SSL right here. And you can go in there and it'll tell you what this whole thing is about to see if that's what you really want to talk about or use a quote out of. Does that make sense? To support SSL. So I go back here to the results list and I can actually do this. SSL PKI, SSL or PKI, risk of PKI, 
I can read right here my abstract PDF full text. Is there any questions? And then when you open it up, it'll give you that article. But those three steps will take you what you need to do. And then you can actually come in here and print it out because you have the access to be able to do it. See, this is just a one-page article right here. On the right there, there's an option, too, where it'll cite it for you, too. Yeah. If you click that site, you click APA, Actually, that's incorrect. Thank you. It's last name. Yeah. There is an M L A that you can. That's incorrect. Yeah. But right here. Don't use this because this is incorrect. It's going to be the last name unless unless the last name of the guy is Carl. And then you be Carl, comma, Ellison, comma, D, period. It looks like Car Carl Ellison. Yes, he is Carl Ellison. So it's a wrong link. But anyway, that's how you do it. Do what?